Maybe you're here today and you're going, okay, why on earth are you doing a collection uh, like this one? Well, there's a few reasons why I think we should kind of just preface this as we kind of get into it for the next few weeks. Um, Number one, uh, I'm really passionate about this subject. In fact, the last 12 years of me being in full-time ministry, I've spent most of those years and most of my time around a lot of single people. Uh, Don Shree and I, before we started this church, we were a part of a ministry called Rendezvous, which was a young adult ministry reaching 20-somethings, and uh, we spent a lot of time cutting our teeth, sharing about relationships, sharing about this season called being single. Uh, But it's not just that I'm passionate about it. I I also sense, if I can really be honest with you, a responsibility. Uh, Your boy is now a father of three. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And um, I know in my house, it's my responsibility to teach my children God's word. And one of those areas, I wanna teach them about confidence and security in Christ. And as our church has grown over the last six years, although I am married and although I have been out of this season for a long time, I sense a responsibility for so many in this room and watching online that are a part of our house, that look to us, that are saying, we want God's word. And I wanna be a spiritual parent to you. I wanna tell you what God's word says about this season. But I think, I think the third reason why I'm really teaching on this for the next few weeks is because there's really a lot of lack of resources. Like there's a whole lot of stuff out there about how to be married, how to, how to get married, but no one really tries to zero in around this season of singleness. And so for the next few weeks, this is what I'm gonna be diving into. There's a lot of things I wanna share. I'm gonna preach some things from the book, but you know, I started getting ready this week and like everything I'm preaching is parts of the book, but a whole lot of stuff that's not in the book, okay? So uh, if you're a part of this church, I'm gonna give it to you as real as I possibly can. And I think God's gonna encourage you. Do me a favor really quick. If you're here today and you are single in the room, you're single in the room and you, and you don't have this book yet. Oh my goodness, look at this. I'm, I'm coming over to you, coming over to you, coming over to you. Make some noise, make some noise. What is this barrier? This is crazy. How are you? What's your name? Uh, Betanya. Betanya? You might not be single after today. Amen. Oh, who knows? Give it up for Britannia. We're really, really happy she's in church. She's amazing. So maybe there's some people in the room right now. You're like, all right, bro. Well, I'm married 10 years, three kids. I'll see you in four weeks, Rich. Um, (laughs) But let me just speak to all the people that are not single because you're like, really, man, I I didn't didn't, didn't come for this. A few reasons why I think that you you need to stick around. Uh, Number one, there's a lot of people in our church. In fact, the majority of our church is made up of single people that sit through all sorts of collections around relationships. Something tells me, yeah, look at that single people clapping right there. Um, something tells me that you can, you can handle one. Uh, number two, another reason why I just think this matters for those of you that are married 20 years, 30 years, that are thinking about maybe taking a vacation or a sabbatical from VU, come back in Easter. But no, I want you to stay. Uh, the other reason why is because you probably know someone who's single. And I think a lot of what we're gonna teach is gonna give you assets and resources to help those people in your life. And then number three, this is the one you probably don't like very much. Uh, just because you're married doesn't mean that you shouldn't be single and secure. In fact, um, this is something that I've taught for years, and this will probably show up a lot of times over the next four weeks. But if you're taking notes today, write this down, because this is really, really important. Healthy relationships are built on healthy individuals. Healthy, yeah, come on, somebody, make a little bit of noise if you know what I'm talking about. Like... I think if we're not careful, what we will do is we will put the emphasis on somebody else and we will fail to realize that even though I'm married or even though I'm in a relationship, I still need to learn how to be single and secure. Some of you in this room, like you're married and miserable, but maybe the problem is not the other person. Maybe the problem is you. Why? Because many relationship problems, this is just the truth, are actually individual issues. <laughs> And so for the next few weeks in this collection, I want you to understand that I am preaching to everybody. This is not my book. This is our book. This isn't my teaching. This is our teaching. This is truth for every one of us. How many of y'all know you're born an individual? You will die an individual? Unless you're like that scene from the notebook at the end, you know? Um, (laughs) You're going to die an individual. And one day you will stand before a righteous God as an individual. The question is, did you live your life single and secure? Did you find contentment? Did you find peace? Did you find everything you were looking for in Christ Jesus? Or did you try to make somebody else your God? How many of y'all know, if you want to end married and happy, start single and secure. 
And some of us, we're getting back to the basics over the next few weeks. We believe that God's gonna meet us where we are. And throughout this collection, I'm gonna talk about a lot of things. Definitely gonna teach about marriage. Definitely gonna teach about dating. I'm gonna talk about heartbreak and pain and trauma. But before we get to any of those things, we gotta start with you. Everyone say me. Someone say, this is a word for me. So part one of Single and Secure, John chapter eight, verse 31. Uh, this scripture came up so many times in my study on the Mindsets Collection. And I just wanna start right there again because I think it's, a, it's an important scripture. This is what Jesus says, John chapter eight, verse 31. Jesus says, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. So if we're gonna be a disciple, we have to, we have to hold to something. We have to hold to what Jesus said. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. I, I preach it a lot that the truth doesn't set you free. It's knowing the truth. It's applying the truth. It's doing the truth. And I wanna preach on, on this first week from the subject, don't believe the lie. Don't believe the lie. As we studied early on this year, we know that the enemy is a liar. And we talked about seven weeks from that idea that the enemy is constantly and continually lying to us. And when we believe his lies, that's when we give him power. He actually has no power over us unless we believe his lie. And when it comes to relationships and when it comes to individuals and when it comes to single people, there's a whole lot of lies that take place in our life. Uh, I heard this quote uh, not too long ago regarding World War II and regarding uh, the Nazis. And uh, many don't know if it's, if it's a real quote from them, but either which way you'll get the meaning of it because this is what so often Hitler and the Nazis believed. And it was simply this, if you tell a lie big enough and regularly repeat it, people will eventually come to believe it. And this is what the enemy does in our life. He continually lies to us and tells us things to believe over and over and over again. And the more we hear it, the more we start to believe it. And the lie that I believe happens to so many single people is, here's the big lie. This is the big lie. I need a spouse for security. I need a spouse for security. There's a lot of us in this room that we're single today and we haven't gotten married. And part of the reason why I wrote this book is because I, I so often feel like in church, all we tell people to do is just get married. You know, just, just get married. That'll, that'll solve everything. Just get married. Not really. Um, sometimes all that does is just put a ring on your problems. <laughs> it, it doesn't just solve everything. And so there's a lot of single people today that keep hearing this lie, whether it came from church people who meant good or whether it came from the world itself, which is saying, you need a spouse to develop security in your life. And because of it, so many single people that I talk to, they sense that they are stuck in life. I don't know if you've walked in here today and I don't know if you feel stuck, but I want to encourage you that you're not stuck because you're single. <laughs> I remember... Um, my first car that I got when I was 16 years of age, uh, my dad, he had taken the family car, which was a 1993 Ford Orange Explorer. Holler at your boy. And um, he had taken my car and he had kind of had the paint updated. He had put carbon fiber on the inside. He put two 12s in the back. Some of y'all don't know about 12s in the back. <laughs> Remember back in the day when you used this, the, the point of listening to music was just for the bass to be all the way up? And I remember he, he called me, he said, Rich, come outside. When, he came, when I came outside, he was down the street and I could hear Fred Hammond, you're blessed in the city. <laughs> Y'all don't know about worship. And um, this thing was like a quarter mile down the road, but I could just hear it blaring, blessed, blessed, you're blessed in the city. And my dad pulls in with the Ford Orange Explorer, 243,000 miles on that thing, bro. <laughs> That car lasted me about seven months until it finally died. <laughs> After it died, I got my, my second car. And my second car was actually amazing because on my 17th birthday, my mom, I didn't know she was gonna do it. She woke, wakes me up and she takes me to go get a brand new car. It was like this, one of those kind of moments I'll never, ever forget. And I'll definitely never forget it because that car that I got at 17 years of age is still the car that I drive at 37 years of age. <laughs> stewardship, stewardship. 
That was a 2001 Jeep Wrangler. Now, I still drive that exact same car that I bought when I was 17 years of age, and I've got so many good memories in that car. I, I, maybe I'll preach a whole collection on, on the Jeep, because <laughs> honestly, there, there's, there's some great testimonies from the Jeep. But when I went to Bible college in Cleveland, Tennessee, um, I was sent up there by my parents to Tennessee from Miami, which felt at the time like a great tragedy. But as I got there, you know, I'm a, I'm a dude from the city. What's up? Jeep Wrangler 2001, black on black. What you know about this? And <laughs> when I get there, uh, I, meet some, I meet some friends, or I should say um, acquaintances at the moment. And these boys are from Tennessee. This is a whole different breed. I mean, these guys are, man, look at that Jeep. And um, I was like, what'd you say? And um, <laughs> man, that's a Jeep. I was like, okay, well, that's, yeah, you know. And they said, man, you ever take that thing mud? I said, excuse me? <laughs> Thought they cursed at me or something. And um, you ever take that thing off road? I said, no, I try to stay on the road with it. <laughs> and they said, well, let's... Uh, Let's take you for a little, little trip. And so they, they took me into the backwoods of Tennessee. And I was, I was doing good. You know I mean? I was like, this is awesome. I'm in my Jeep and there's mud flying. And it, it was awesome until we finally came to this point where there was this big, huge uh, mud hole. And they're like, man, take, the, take that thing right through, man. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like I, don't, I don't know if she swims or not, you know? And they're like, you got it, man. And how many of y'all know, like, it matters who you hang out with, you know? Because if you only hang out with dumb people, eventually you do dumb stuff. It's another collection. But anyways, I was like, all right, I got it. And before you know it, I have a twang too. I'm like, all right, let's go. And so uh, <laughs> I hit the gas, bro. And I, I run into this, I don't want to call it a mud puddle because it sounds such like, like so little. This was like a deep hole, okay? And as soon as I hit into this thing, my car just hits right in the mud and it gets stuck. I mean, I'm totally stuck. And now I'm kind of freaking out. I'm like, I'm gonna have to call my parents. Like, I'm in Tennessee. I don't know who these people are that are with me. I'm in the backwoods. This is getting scary. And they're like, don't you worry. We're, we're gonna pull you out of there. I said, okay, cool. Like, 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 you gotta get me out. I'm stuck in the mud. And I'll never forget this moment. And this is, this, is, this is the truth. This dude goes into his car and he comes out from his car. And in his hand, he is holding an extension cord. I said, I said what, are we, what are we plugging into? He said, no, I'm gonna pull you out with this. I was like, bro, that's not gonna work, you know? He said, it'll work. I said, okay, and you know you're desperate when you're like agreeing to solutions that you know won't work, you know? This guy ties an extension cord to the front of my Jeep and then he puts it on the back of his truck and you already guessed it. As soon as he hits the gas, the extension cord, it just snaps. It, it wasn't strong enough to pull me out of the position of being stuck. Why? Because when you're stuck, you need something stronger than what you're stuck in. And I just wonder how many of us today, we feel like we're stuck and we are convinced the way to be not stuck is to get a spouse. But I just wanna to preach to everyone out there, to married people and to single people, your spouse is not strong enough to pull you out of the place where you feel stuck today. That's not the role or the responsibility of a spouse. Only a savior can do that type of work. And so what the enemy does is the enemy keeps handing us extension cords. And it's not just relationships, right? We do this with all sorts of things. We think if we get married, we'll never be lonely again. Not true. We think if we get prom a promotion at the job, we'll, we'll never have financial pressure again. Not true. It's an extension cord. We think if we have kids, then we'll finally fulfill the need that we have for love, but, but not true. It's an extension cord. We think if we move to another city, then somehow that will make us more disciplined. Not true. It's an extension cord. These things are not bad in and of themselves, but what they are is they're finite. They're, they're, they're limited. They are not God. God is God. And there's some things that only God can do in our life. Don't believe the lie today that you have to live unhappy, dissatisfied, insecure, simply because you are missing something in this life. A spouse doesn't produce security, maybe financial security, hello. <laughs> 
maybe some emotional security, maybe some social security, but they can't provide soul security. They can't provide eternal security. There is only one who can meet that need. I want you to write this down because this is important. Every lie we tell incurs a debt on the truth. And during our mindsets collection, I was studying about the negative thoughts that we have. And what I discovered is, is that for every negative thought that you have, you need at least three positive thoughts to counter that. Meaning that negativity tends to stick, but positivity tends to roll off of us. I wonder how many times we keep hearing the lie from culture and because of it, we keep believing the lie. And every time we believe the lie, we never find the freedom that Christ promised us. Instead, we find ourselves bound, insecure, fearful, feeling less than, feeling like we don't measure up. And so today, what we need is to counter this lie is we need the truth. And because I, I gave you one lie, I wanna give you three truths today just to kick off this collection. And this is, these are truths that apply to everybody in the room and everybody online. First truth that we have to get into our soul. Number one is that Jesus completes your order. I've learned pastoring the church for six years that if I'm not careful, what I will do is I will spend all my time saying new things to old people. But really, I need to spend more time saying old things to new people. There's a whole lot of people that are brand new to Vu Church and you still haven't learned this revelation. This is everything when it comes to your relationships. I'm not proud of it, but every once in a while in a weak moment, I'll find myself going to McDonald's. <laughs> Don't judge me. Number two, plain cheeseburger, large fry. You ever notice that when you get to the fast food line and you make your order, they finally say at the end of it, does that complete your order? And if you're anything like me, you're like, well, I don't know. <laughs> Come to think of it, I'm not quite sure if I'm satisfied yet. <laughs> a McFlurry, please. Um, how do y'all think you get those apple pies in your bag? That was a, does that complete your order? No, I think I want an apple pie at 1 a.m. Why? Because if you get thirsty enough, you'll drink anything. And there is a world out there that continues to believe the lie and the world keeps looking back at you. It doesn't matter how much you get. It doesn't matter how much you uh, acquire in your life. There's this creeping question. Does that complete your order? And I wanna let you know that nothing will complete your order other than Jesus Christ himself. I call it, I call it small gods. In fact, I think there's like four small gods that we all kind of become victim to. And I don't know what your other small god is or your counterfeit god, your other idol. I know that's a weird word to use, but an idol is anything that we place before God. And there's things and temptations that all of us, married or single, that we are tempted to put in the place of God. I think there's four small gods that a lot of us fall victim to. The, the first small god is the god of self. That it, like the world would just say, yo, trust yourself, make yourself happy. If you'll, just, if you'll just make yourself happy, then everything else will be happy. And so a lot of people go through life just trying to please themselves. But what you'll discover is, is there's no purpose. There's no satisfaction in only living for yourself. Right. Trust your gut, man. All right, well, that led to three divorces. I saw a meme the other day, trust my gut? That thing can't even handle milk. That's good. Um, <laughs> the scripture says that the heart is deceitful above all things. This is why this heart of stone has to be turned to a heart of flesh and it only happens through relationship with Jesus. I'm not living for myself. I lie to myself. I disappoint myself. I, I, I never follow through with myself. I, I can't make my aim and my goal to, to be completed in myself. That, that, that won't happen. There won't be real satisfaction living for myself. So, so we kind of learned that lesson. It's like, all right, it's, and it's not self. You know what it is? It's other people. And this is where a lot of us, when it comes to relationship talks, we live right here. I know what I'm missing. I'm missing another person. And before you know it, we make other people our gods. But yo, happiness is an inside job. If you leave it up for other people to bring you joy and contentment, you will always be disappointed. People make terrible gods. Some of you parents in this room, I love you so much, but your four-year-old is a bad God. 
my son Wyatt this morning, you know, it's like, dude, I love him, but I don't worship him. He's four and his emotions are fickle. <laughs> but we begin to live vicariously through our kids or we try to make our spouse our savior. Let me get married because then if I get married, I won't have any problems. Not true. You need to hear this. Marriage doesn't erase problems. It exposes them. I mean, go back to the earliest scripture about marriage. This is powerful. Genesis chapter two, verse 24. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh. I want you to see this. Marriage is not about a 50% person and another 50% person coming to make a 100%. It doesn't say two halves will make a whole. That's not what marriage is. Marriage is about two whole people getting together and becoming a brand new thing, becoming one. So I'm sorry, Jerry Maguire, but you got it wrong. I know it makes me cry, and I cry too. You complete me. No, you don't. There's only one that completes me. His name is Jesus. And anything short of Jesus, I will be disappointed. See, marriage is not about completion. It's about creation. When you get married, it's something brand new. It is, it is not the same. It's, it's something new. It's not gonna solve all your problems. Well, if we learn that lesson, we kind of go from myself to others. And then a lot of us, we turn to religion. And religion is a small God. Religion comes in all sorts of shapes and sizes and people fall victim to it. And the best way to describe religion is simply this. Yo, when I do something good, God owes me. And when I do something bad, I owe God. Yet both are a lie. Jesus did not come to institute a religion. He came to establish a relationship with you. He wants a relationship with you. Religion will fail you. It'll fail you. Well, if we get burned by religion, you know what a lot of people end up doing? They go to the last small guy, which is the world. And we go, you know what? I'm just gonna go the world's way. And the thing with the world's way is, is you can start heading in that direction. And for a time, it's quite pleasurable. In fact, the scripture says that sin is pleasurable for a season. But how many know, like all seasons, it comes to an end. How many know, if it's not fun in the morning, it, it wasn't fun the night before either. Sin is pleasurable for a season, but here's what I know about sin. When I follow the way of the world is that sin will always take me further than I wanted to go, keep me longer than I wanted to stay, and cost me more than I was ever willing to pay. The world is empty. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world, but he forfeits his soul? The world, religion, other people, myself, they won't complete my order. There is only one, his name is Jesus. This is why Jesus said in John chapter 15, write this down today, this is an incredible scripture. He says, I am the vine and you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. He's talking about, you wanna have an impact? Do you wanna have a legacy? You wanna leave something great on this earth? You can't do it in your own strength. You can't do it with self-power. You can't do it pleasing other people. You can't do it in the name of religion. You can't do it for the world. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. Now, it's important that you stop when you read this parable and realize that if we're not careful, we tend to... Uh, we tend to literize things that are allegory and then we, try, we tend to allegorize things that are literal in the scripture. Whenever you're reading a parable, be careful that you don't make it universally true to all situations. There's something that Jesus is trying to convey. He's not teaching about salvation. He's teaching about bearing fruit. He says this. He says, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given you. This is to my father's glory that you bear much fruit showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. Stay with me, remain in me. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. Watch this. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be what? Complete. Complete complete, that your joy may be complete. 
Jesus is teaching right now about being connected to the vine and that when I'm connected to Jesus, that's how I bear fruit. What is the fruit he's referring to? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. How many know that all nine of those words, they result in you living a secure, confident, joyful life? So if you wanna bear fruit, he says, you gotta remain in me. Notice there's a distinction taking place. He says, I am the vine and you are the branches. You gotta remain in me if you wanna bear fruit. A lot of us, we get mistaken with being connected versus being close. But yo, you can take a branch and you can put it close to the tree, but just because it's close to the tree doesn't mean that it's complete and it certainly doesn't mean it's gonna bear any fruit. This is where a lot of people get mistaken in 2022 because we mistake Christian activity with being connected to Jesus. A lot of us, we we come to church, God bless it, and we come to church because we wanna feel the fire of God. Makes us feel good. I'm, 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 I, just, I just feel good. I like to start my week on Sunday and I just feel good. But yo, being connected to Jesus is not about emotion. It's about devotion. It's about, I'm, I'm actually connected. I, w- I, wanna, I wanna bear fruit. Rich, how do I know the difference between being close versus being connected? It's quite simple. Both close and connected get to dwell in God's presence but it's only those that are connected that walk out of the room and actually step into obedience. People that just get close to God, they, just, they, they wanna get into his presence, but they don't wanna walk in obedience. This is what Jesus says. Jesus says, if you, how do you remain in me? Obey my commands. Obedience. So when I start getting in God's presence, but then when I actually obey the truth, This is what Jesus said in John 8. When you know the truth, when I obey it, when I do it, what is that gonna result in? That's gonna result in me bearing fruit. I'm gonna bear joy. I'm gonna have joy. My joy is gonna be complete in him. When he's speaking about joy, he's not just talking about feeling happy or feeling good. Joy comes from the depths. Joy comes from the inside out. Joy is a confidence and a security. No matter what is going on in my life, I can walk in joy. See, my connection to Christ is my completion in him. When I'm connected to him, I'm complete in him. And I wonder today, are you complete in Jesus? Because I'm gonna teach some stuff on relationships, but honestly, it just becomes positive thinking and principles that you could get anywhere in the world if this isn't first true in your life. The enemy wants to lie to you, but don't believe his lie. Jesus completes your order. And guess what? He's not like a fast food line. (laughs) Taste and see that the Lord is good. Once you get a taste of Jesus, you are fulfilled. You are satisfied. He meets your needs. Truth number one, Jesus completes your order. But truth number two, you gotta get this. You are worthy of love. I just, we gotta start the collection here that every one of us in this room, you are worthy of love. This word single, I don't like it because um, yeah, singleness is not a monolith. Monolith is, is a sociological term that tends to uh, group categories of people together and it removes all of their individuality. And it, it's tricky even uh, teaching on a subject like this or certainly writing a book on a subject like this because the idea of being a single is that it's not just one group of people. Being single means I'm unmarried or I'm not in a relationship right now. But how many know that's a wide array of stories? We, we've got people that are you know, in college and they're single right now. We got people that are post-college in, in the workforce that are single right now. We got people that were divorced and single. We have widows in this room. We have people that were betrayed or hurt. We have people in this room that have betrayed and hurt people. We have all sorts of stories that are in this room. And if we're not careful, what can begin to happen is in our journey of being a single, sometimes the lie of the enemy is, is that you're not worthy of love. I'm also gonna teach throughout this collection that some of y'all are called to be single. Some of y'all like are like, dude, I'm coming to this collection, but like, I don't wanna get married. I don't wanna be in a relationship. I am happy and content with Jesus. And I think that's really quite beautiful. We'll talk more about that. But there's others of you in this room that like, you're kind of like, dude, get to this stuff about like how I find, you know, like I'm here. Uh, I got, I came to the early service. Like I want to meet somebody, you know, I'm here tonight. Like, and we're going to get there. But, but it has to start with this idea that you, you are worthy of love. 
Because on this journey of singleness, sometimes people, they stop believing that they're worthy of love. And you can either magnify what's missing or who you're becoming. Who are you becoming? Because what I've learned with a lot of people is that many times what takes place is, is that we stop believing that we are worthy of love. And before you know it, we allow people to hurt us. We allow people to take advantage of us. Listen, if you don't value yourself, you'll start putting yourself on clearance. And we let people hurt us. We let people lie to us. We let people betray us. Let me just say to any person in this room right now, like, yo, you are worth it to God. You are valuable. You, you, you shouldn't be cheated on. You, you, no one should ever put their hands on you. People should learn how to talk to you with respect. Why? Because you are valuable to God. Listen, I, I, I totally understand. I've made some mistakes, but I am not a mistake. You've made some mistakes, but you are not a mistake. I, I don't, you're not a mistake. You are loved by a perfect God. And if a perfect God can love you, you can certainly learn today to start loving yourself also. You're worthy of love. Someone say this, say, say, I am worthy of love. I've just learned that many times in relationships, people can carry such shame and it silences us and we start believing the lie that somehow we're not valuable or we're not worth it. And I just have to come with the truth today that every one of you in this room, you are worthy of love. How do I know? Because this is what the Bible says, 1 John chapter four. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is beautiful. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. The only reason why we can love somebody else is because he first loved us. God goes first. God first loved you. The only reason why you have a capacity for love or understand love or desire love is because he first loved you. God goes first. It's important because I'm telling you, all of your relationships, they will be impacted by whether or not you believe you're worthy of love. In fact, when Jesus teaches about the greatest commandments, he presumes and assumes that you already love yourself. Mark chapter 12, verse 31. This is the second commandment, that you shall love your neighbor as, your, as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Before you can love someone else, you have to love yourself. Loving yourself is not selfish, it's stewardship. It's stewardship. And if I have a mission in this collection, it's to get some of you guys to recognize that God has loved you and now you can begin to love yourself so that you can love others properly. How many, know, how many of y'all know you, you can't give that which you don't have? Some of us, we, we wanna jump the gun, but we ourselves, we're not even loving or preferring or taking care of ourselves. Listen, if you don't love yourself, why would you expect someone else to? If you don't love yourself, why would you expect someone else to? Truth number one, Jesus completes your order. Truth number two is simply you are worthy of love. And truth number three, as we come to a close today, is every season has a blessing. Every season has a blessing. And this is a massive theme of what I wanna talk about for the next four to five weeks. Because maybe you're here today and you're saying, I feel like I'm, I'm struggling. But I have learned that in every struggle, there is always a hidden blessing. There's always a hidden blessing. Look at what Jesus said in Matthew chapter five, verse four. He says this, blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. I've read that so many times, but you know what I missed? I missed the simple fact that even in your mourning, there is a blessing. It tells me that in my darkest moment, in my loneliest moment, in my season of hurting and a season of fear, worry, there's still a blessing that, 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 that's hidden. There's a blessing in every season. And it's Jesus who helps us learn how to mine out the gold in the season that we're in. Culture would try to tell us that we're limited by being single. We're limited by not being in a relationship. But I just don't find that true in God's word. Jesus Christ, just so we all know, saved the world being single. <laughs> The majority of the New Testament was written by a guy who never got married. 
His name is Paul. Say, Rich, why are you telling me that? I'm telling you that because here's two great examples of men who did incredible, unbelievable things without ever having a spouse. Is it wrong to have a spouse? No, I mean, marriage is beautiful. Marriage is awesome. And many of you, you're here today or watching online and that, that's your desire. And I wanna help teach you through God's word how to, how to get there. But, but others of us right now, we, we are missing out on the beauty of what's in front of us because we think there's something missing instead of focusing on who we're becoming. Look what the apostle Paul writes. He actually is challenging and commanding the church. He's saying like, not all y'all are called to be married. So when the church just says, hey, everyone get married, they're not, they're not reading Paul's letter to the church in Corinth because this is what Paul says. He says, I wish that all of you were as I am. He's speaking to the church leaders. He's like, I wish y'all were single like me. And his practical reason for why wishing that they were all single is because he thinks being single that they can get more done for the gospel, that they've got more freedom and more ability not have to be thinking about their other half. He says, but each of you has your own, look at the word, each of you has your own gift from God. One has this gift and another has that gift. Rich, what are you saying? I'm saying that being married is a gift. But here's what a lot of people don't preach about. Being single is a gift. And each one of us, as the body of Christ, we should encourage each other to lean into the gift of whatever that season looks like. I remember when I was younger, when I first moved to Miami, um, I was 14 years of age and I, I was just so new to the city and it was our first Christmas coming up and I think my parents were trying to, you know, comfort us and encourage us because they knew it was a, quite a challenging move for us coming to the city and leaving to come Washington. And so my dad's like, you know, what do you want for Christmas? I want to get you something great for Christmas. And I was like, all right, dad, um, I want a surfboard. I didn't know that Miami has no waves whatsoever, but I was like the beach, you know, I'm going to get a surfboard. And so my dad's like, cool, cool, cool. So like, I'd been like, I want a surfboard. I want a surfboard. I want a surfboard. And I remember we got to, to Christmas day and under the tree, there was certainly no surfboard under the tree. And we kind of started opening gifts. I know I'm like a privileged little brat. I was kind of on the inside. I definitely wouldn't show my dad, but on the inside, I was like, I can't believe it. You know, my dad made such a big deal about asking me what I wanted. I told him what I wanted. And now we're here at Christmas and there's no surfboard. And my dad was always the guy who like loved to belabor something, you know, loved to really, you know, take it long. And so we gone through all the gifts. And, and lastly, he's like, oh, Rich, um, there's one more gift under this tree. I was like, well, what is it? And it's a little card. And, and he brings it over to me. And I'm kind of on the inside, like already like so annoyed, like, dude, once again, why'd you ask me what I want, you know? And I kind of was like, oh, okay, cool. He's like, he's like, you gotta open it. I'm like, oh, he's like, open it. And I'm like, okay. So I opened the card. And when I opened the card, a little note on the inside said, go look in the garage. You gotta love my dad, right? From surfboards to 1993 Ford Orange Explorers. He's been, he's been blessing me for a while. I went in the garage and there was my surfboard. I was like, oh, dad, you did it. You know, he's like, of course. I, I heard your need and I heard your request and I'm a good father, I'm, I'm a meet it. I think what I reflect about that story is, is I wonder how many of us, the gift that God has for us, it's actually what we're looking for. It's just not wrapped the way we wanted it to be wrapped. And how many y'all know that unless I unwrap that gift, I would never discover what my father had purchased for me. And many of us, we're in a season right now and we're quite certain that there is nothing good in that season, that there's no blessing in that season, that it's only pain, it's only loneliness, it's only more of what you are missing. But I wonder, have you taken the time to unwrap the gift? Have you taken time to discover that maybe there's something more in that season if you'll lean into it and if you'll unwrap it, maybe you'll find the thing that you have been hoping for, praying for, asking for, maybe it's closer than you think because you serve a good father. And he's gonna meet your needs. He cares about your needs. But we gotta do some unwrapping. For the next few weeks, we're gonna do some unwrapping. I wanna help you unwrap what this season looks like. It's gonna help single people for sure, but it's gonna help married people. It's gonna help divorced people. 
It's gonna help lonely people. It's gonna help hurting people because I believe there is a blessing in every season. So Rich, how can you be so confident? Well, this is the gospel, isn't it? That while we were powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. While we were yet sinners, Christ loved me. Meaning at my darkest moment, at my worst moment, when I was so far from God, that's when God came and said, I've got the greatest gift for you. I've got the greatest blessing for you. It's gonna be hidden in a cross. It's gonna be hidden in a baby in a manger. It's gonna be hidden in a man from Nazareth. But if you will continue to unwrap, you're gonna discover life and life more abundantly. You're gonna discover the truth that will set you free. Don't believe the lie. Hey, this is Rich and Don Sheree Wilkerson, and we want to say thank you so much for watching and engaging with today's content. Maybe today you want to make the decision to follow Jesus. Why don't you pray this prayer with me? Dear Jesus, today I choose to entrust my life to you. Forgive me of my sins. Make me a new creation. I love you. In Jesus' name, amen. We're celebrating with you the decision that you've made, and we wanna walk this journey out alongside you. Yeah, and if you just prayed that prayer, why don't you go ahead and follow the prompts that are on the screen right now? We're so glad that you took some time to watch today's message. Do us a favor, if it encouraged you, if it impacted you, go ahead and share this. And if you haven't already, go ahead and subscribe to the Voo Church YouTube channel so you can continue to get more content like this. We love you guys, and we're declaring the best is yet to, to come. come.